computer. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to this um, uh, ISW meeting, uh, Independent Socialist in Wellington meeting with uh, John Padwick, who I'll introduce in a minute, on the theme this evening of the Newton Rebellion of 1607 um, and the Midland Rebellion of the same year, which of which the Newton Rebellion is a part. So John will, will explain later about the links between the two. Um, John is uh, well known uh, locally, and certainly in North Northamptonshire. Um, he's an ex-Borough uh, Councillor uh, for Kettering, a Kettering Borough Councillor. Um, he's currently, uh, <coughs> amazingly, in, in my view, the chair of Geddington uh, Parish Council. I mean, Geddington's sort of one of the bluest parishes. No, the, that's it, not true. That's not true, okay. Paul. OK. You, you can Labour held Geddington like. Newton and Little Oakley for about 12 years. There you go. Okie dokie. Well, I think that's more to do with you, John, really, than the, than, than the work that you put in. Mm, as underlying socialism. I here. mean, OK. I, I, I stand corrected. Geddington's the revolutionary centre of uh, Northamptonshire. <laughs> and John is chair of the, uh, the parish council, who, which will be leading the revolution. And I understand that they recently noted um, the fact that there's the coronation next week and, and then moved on to the next business. So John is also, uh, he lives in Geddington uh, near Kettering and Newton uh, is not far from Geddington. What, how, how far, John? A couple of miles? Um, Spitting distance, it's, yeah, mm, a mile really. Okay, about a mile. Or less. From, mm. from Geddington. And uh, he's a, he's a semi-retired teacher and uh he told me earlier that he he never intends to retire so i pity the poor kids who are going to have this grumpy old bugger for for a long while and he's also a uh, campaign coordinator for kettering labor party yeah, um, can see so, labor party and is so he's very active politically in the north of the county and uh and so john i very much welcome you to this uh, isw meeting this evening so over to you uh, on the Newton Rebellion of 1607. Thank you. Cheers, Paul. I'm really pleased to be here. Now, I'm going to switch on to sharing screens. I hope this works. Uh, most of the talk, in fact, all of the talk is going to be based on PowerPoint. I've tried not to over, over PowerPoint it um, and put too many words on the screen. So I'll be talking through it. Um, so please, but please bear with me. I've edited a bit. Uh, it's really quite hard to get it down to a manageable size because every time I think about it, I think about a new aspect. Um, so I'm hoping that tonight um, it will be in a form that we can understand um, and uh, take in. So here we go. Let's see if I can share my screen. Hopefully, yeah, I can do that. And then I should be able to, yeah, can you all see that? Yeah. Yes, yes. we can. Okay, cool. Um, so as Paul said, I, I was a borough councillor for Newton, Geddington and Little Oakley for eight years. And whilst I was a borough councillor, I came upon the story of the Newton Rebellion. And I realised that uh, there, there was nothing around here which commemorated it. There was some information that you could find in academic books. Um, but what I wanted to do was to raise awareness so that people knew the story. People haven't been telling the story, but hopefully they are starting to do so now. And I'm happy that, that the Newton events now are featuring in quite a number of books, historical books and geographical books as well. Um, that people have, uh, where people have picked up information about what went on in June 1607. Um, so from that point of view, we've raised awareness and we've also managed to raise money for a, a memorial stone in Newton, which you can see there, um, and a, an interpretation board, which tells the story um, of what happened um, in the weeks leading up to the 8th of June 1607. So, big thanks to a number of people. Jim Carr, um, who was head of Highfields Primary, 
Ian Addis, who was head of Geddington Primary School, and I'm a teacher. Both of those two people did loads of work on um, the Newton events um, and helped me to find out more information. Bill Bellamy um, wrote about um, Geddington Chase and included information about um, the events at Newton. And Geddington Chase is a very, very, um, very well researched historical book about about the chase. Steve Hendel, we got a lot of help from um, when we had the campaign to raise money for the memorial. Um, he was professor of history at University of Warwick. Now he's in the States. Um, and it was he who told me that actually this is um, uh, this is um, early modern early modern history and I didn't realize it was early modern history but this is early modern history. Rhys Jones has written the book Violent, Violent Borders, Refugees and the Right to Move. Um, he's a professor of geography and he, we've got a chapter in his book and of course Nick Hayes um, who's a, a radical campaigner for land rights and he has included information about us in the book of Trespass. All of those books I recommend. Um, and Reese, Nick and Steve have all visited um, Geddington and Newton and found out sort of firsthand about what happened. OK, once upon a time, there's a story of enclosure that didn't end well. I was fascinated. I think it was probably one of the things that first got me interested because I always thought that Elizabeth I reigned over a, a happy country where everything was golden, um, the days of good Queen Bess. And then I realised that within 50 years, we chopped the King of England's head off. So something was going not quite right over that period. Either it hadn't been going quite right under Elizabeth, and I think that's true, um, but something certainly went very badly wrong in between 1603 and 1649. Um, and that obviously ties in with the change of dynasty from the Tudors to the Stuarts. Um, and in 1603, James I of England and James VI of Scotland came to the English throne. Um, and as he came to the throne, there was, it was a new dynasty, there was new uncertainty, but there was also new chances. And um, he wanted to create a whole raft of new knights. And so all people who were all men who were worth more than 30 pounds a year were ordered to present themselves at the coronation, the king's coronation to be knighted. And amongst those um, those people, those people who were being knighted was um, Sir Edward Montague of Boughton. Um, and Sir Edward Montague of Boughton had a neighbour in Rushton, Sir Thomas Tresham. Sir Thomas Tresham of Rushton had a longer um, ped pedigree than, uh, than Montague did have. And Tresham was uh, concerned about what was going on because he said that some of these new knights were landless, many base and dosser headed clowns and uh, not among not not one among 40 worthy of that degree so he wasn't happy with that with the the change of um of status here are the two sir thomas tresham and sir edward montague they lived on either side of what is now the um main road uh, between Tresh between geddington and uh, uh, and little oakley uh, sir thomas tresham was or had been described as the most odious man in the county. And he was descended from the Attorney General of Henry V and was a Catholic, the old faith. But Sir Edward Montague, um, on the other side of the road, what is now the road, which then became the Stamford Turnpike, I think, he was descended from Lord Chief Justice of Henry VIII um, and was knighted at, as I said, uh, James I's coronation. Um, he was sort of new money, really. Thomas Tresham was very much old money. In charge of the county of Northampton at that time, time was um, Thomas Cecil, Earl of Exeter, Lord Burley, based in a Burley house, which was at that time in um, Northamptonshire. And he had the two deputy left lieutenants, Sir Edward Montague of Boughton, who we just talked about, and Sir Anthony Mildmay of Apethorpe. And there they are, the pictures of them, little selfies. Okay. 
um, Tresham wasn't popular, um, which is presumably why he was uh, he was called the, the most odious man in the country, in the county. Um, and one of his servants warned him that he's enclosing too much land. Um, and he said that you're not forgotten for Hazel Beach, because in Hazel Beach, he enclosed land, took land away from the common people. Um, there's more history there. Orton tenants petitioned the king not to, uh, not to agree Francis Tresham's scheme to improve rents at Orton, which by improving rents, it meant increasing rents uh, um, at Orton. Um, so the family wasn't popular. Um, and uh, Thomas Tresham had been building edifices to his faith because he was a, a strong Roman Catholic and had been fined and imprisoned for recusancy several times. Um, but he was a very important man. He died in 1605, and um, Thomas, uh, sorry, his son, um, Francis Tresham, uh, became involved in the gunpowder plot. And we know what happened there to the gunpowder treason. Um, a group of young Catholic um, gentry, really, um, not happy with how, the way things are going, were trying to get rid of the king who they thought might have turned England back to the true faith of Catholicism, but James I didn't. Um, Montague was appointed High Sheriff of Northamptonshire in 1595, created Knight of the Bath um, in 1603. Um, and although we've been talking about Tresham enclosing lands, uh, Montague was quite concerned about um, the enclosure of lands, and he presented a petition to the king partly in favour of, um, of the freedom of ministers, religious ministers in the, in the country who, who refused to obey the rules. Um, but he also spoke against the depopulation of the country due to enclosure. And he talked about the cry of the country. So he, he put forward the view that um, enclosure was causing real difficulties for the people of Northamptonshire. Um, he's he became unpopular with the king around that period of time because of this petition and he had within his family his brothers were um, involved at, at various different um, status had various different statuses within the court and they were not very happy with the way that he was becoming unpopular because it was bringing the family's reputation down so I think they might have encouraged him um, after the gunpowder plot to make a speech to say that there should be a thanksgiving act to um, recognize the saving of the king from being blown up and it was actually um, Thomas sorry Edward Montague who introduced the observance of the 5th of November and the foundation of bonfire night so it started although he wasn't he sounded it sounds as though he was really quite an independent guy and an independent Puritan um, who wanted some freedom of religion um, and wasn't terribly happy about what Tresham was doing and what was happening in other places with the enclosure of land. It was a tough time. 1607, there'd been bad summers and harvests. There was a lot of poverty. People were just about managing or not. There was subs they were reliant on subsistence on common land very much. Um, and the price of wool meant that sheep farming was becoming a more profitable use of land. Hence, landowners enclosing land so that they could use it for sheep farming um, rather than common land. And that seems to have been the case very much in the Midlands um, across Northamptonshire, Warwickshire and Leicestershire. There we go. Some form of enclosure there. Enclosure was fencing off fields that had been used as common land, common land that was used for growing crops and um, grazing animals. Um, the landowner benefited from enclosure because, as I pointed out, um, he would then, he would then, it wasn't she, he would then um, be, have been able to use it for more profitable reasons such as sheep farming. And it severely disadvantaged the common people. Um, they hadn't got the means to produce food at a time when um, food was scarce um, and they were very hard up. Not good. 
John, could I just interrupt you a second? The screen you seems can. to have gone very dark since your last oh, right. slide. Okay. That's it. It's gone. It's gone better now. Is that all right? Uh, no, now it's gone dark again. Is that all right? That's better. That's now. All that's, right. That's bright now. I don't know why it goes dark and light. I don't know either. It was fine to me. Didn't go Did dark. It? Didn't it? Okay. Did it go Let's dark go with on. anybody else or just me then? It's just you, I think, Paul. Oh, strange. Anyway, it's better now. Don't know why. Okay. Um, so Thomas More in, in Utopia, obviously before this period of time, had already been talking about how sheep were um, were devouring men um, because sheep, the, the sheep were throw the um, the emphasis on sheep farming was throwing people off the land um, and causing real difficulties. So that was in in Utopia. Um, he'd been warned, Tresham had been warned, um, as I point, I think we, I used this quote before, um, Hazel Beach, the people of Hazel Beach hadn't forgotten what he did in Hazel Beach, and the common people were exclaiming exceedingly upon enclosures. Um, Newton, just up the road from Geddington is a place which is on the borders of Rockingham Forest. Um, and the forest was a royal forest. Um, and there were certain there were certain rights that commons had in forests, but also there was common land attached to the forests. Um, and there is um, a wasteland an area of common land called and known by the name of the brand adjoining Geddington Woods, um, where people from inhabitants of the villages Geddington, Brigstock, Stanion and Oakley Parva had had and used to have all manner of common upon the said, said brand time out of mind. That's a, a that, that's um, a piece from an inquiry into the spoils that had been committed in Rockingham Forest in 1592 before what happened in 1607. So there was a history of things not going right in this area. So the brand, which you can see a um, a, a little map on here from Burl Benemy's book, um, it shows where the brand is. Um, can you see my um, my mouse there? Yeah. Can you see it? No, you can't. Anyway, it's a, the map at the, in the top left shows Geddington Woods. It shows the brand on the left hand side. It shows um, a road which is going in between the brand and Geddington Woods. That's the Stamford Turnpike um, and what is now the A4300, I think that is. Yeah. Uh, and that's a map that was drawn in 1600. It's right on the borders of Rockingham Forest. Um, and in between Geddington and Little Oakley, if you know the road. Um, and the brand is as you get to the top of the rise, that's where the brand would have been. And it's that land that um, Thomas Tresham um, of Rushton, sorry, Thomas Tresham of Newton, who is the cousin of Thomas Tresham of Rushton, it, um, was enclosing. So the villain of the piece here is not so much Thomas Tresham of Rushton but his cousin Thomas Tresham of Newton and it's him who is enclosing the land um, adjoining Geddington Woods uh, the wasteland which is the brand. Now it's about this time of year isn't it because where are we we're just approaching May Day um, on the day, the night before um, May Day, there was mutterings and gatherings in Pytchley, Ashley and Hazel Beach about enclosure. They weren't happy. I guess that that's a time when there were a lot of celebrations and um, community events that went on for May Day. I guess there was quite a lot of drinking that went on leading up to May Day. And when there's drink involved and people are unhappy about what's been going on, then they get angry. And that's what seems to have happened around that period of time, because from May Eve 1607, it all kicked off across um, the Midlands. 
particularly Northamptonshire, but also in Warwickshire and Leicestershire. And here's a list of the mayhem that uh, went on. 30th of April, there was the mutterings in Rushley, Pychley and Hazel Beach. Um, that spread to Northampton, the 11th of May, Shutlanger on the 21st of May. At some point later than that, in Hill Morton in Warwickshire, there were 3,000 people gathered. Um, and the diggers of Warwickshire produced the document, which we'll have a look at later on. 28th of May in Dunchurch, there were gatherings and protests. 30th of May, the king had become concerned and he issued a royal pro proclamation. The gentry were telling him there's stuff going on and you need to do something about it. Of course, he knows that Northampton, Northamptonshire may have been a hotbed of dissent um, linked with the gunpowder plot. So it, we also know that James was quite a paranoid king, so he would have been probably particularly worried about this. So he issues his um, royal pro proclamation for suppressing of people's riotously assembling. Um, the 31st of May, 5,000 people gathered in Coatsbatch. And Coatsbatch, if you don't know it, is really um, on the uh, board, well, where the, um, the junction of the M1 and the A14, um, just there. Uh, and so there was 5,000 people gathered there. They were joined by supporters from Leicester, so city people were becoming involved. There was a curfew placed on the city, on the city because of that. The gates were closed. There was a gibbet placed up to warn people, but it was torn down by boys. Um, uh, 32 of inhabitants of Leicester nonetheless marched out of the city to join the forces. So you can see that things are gathering momentum. There was um, a gathering, a protest in Withybrook, Warwickshire, on the 31st of May. 1st of June in Coventry, 100 people gathered. 400 in Ladbrook, Warwickshire. 200 people in Chilvers Coton, Warwickshire again. 200 in Ashton on the 6th of June. Another one in another gathering in Wellham in Leicestershire. And at that on the 6th of June, the Royal Proclamation of the 30th of May, saying he, that the king wanted the authorities, particularly the deputy lieutenants, um, not the Lord Lieutenant, because Exeter, the, uh, uh, Exeter was in, still in London, but his deputy lieutenants were in Northamptonshire. So it was down to them to do something about it. And on the 8th of June in uh, Northampton, sorry, in Newton, Northamptonshire, a thousand people gathered. Now, if you know Newton, you'll know that there are probably about 50 people living in Newton. So for a thousand people gathering in 1607 there, it's a large number of people. Here's a little map of um, where the different events took place. And I've got put little, little um, pink dots all over there. So you can see that they um they're not very far away from each other they're probably most of them are within a day's walking of the next closest place and actually they're quite close to the a14 so if the a14 had been built at that time um there would have been a, a much easier communication um than in the 17th century so there's the map um this is the um the manifesto of the diggers of Warwickshire, um, which they produced during the Midland Revolt of 1607 and circulated as a rallying cry, rallying cry to all other diggers. Um, and they signed it. They don't sign names, but they sign it, as you can see there, from Hampton Field in haste. We rest as poor del delvers and day labourers for the good of the Commonwealth until death. Now, one of the things that they underline here and also the people protesting in Newton they were all saying we are loyal to the king we want the king to do something about the enclosures the enclosures they weren't anti-monarchists um, they believed that the king would um, see them right really and that um, manifestoing clearly outlines the problems with enclosures uh, and it states that the people the poor delvers and the day laborers who wrote it against those in these encroaching tyrants, as they call them, which would grind our flesh upon the whetstone of poverty. They state quite clearly that their action wasn't against the crown, but against the enclosures, the enclosures who made them of the 
poorest sort ready to pine for want. It's a remarkable document, really. I've not seen it, but it's in the it's in the British Library, um, and um, the British Library has. If you go to the, to the British Library site and you um, you search for the Midland Revolt, um, you'll find quite a number of documents there, which is which are very interesting, including the uh, Royal Proclamations. Here is one of the Royal Proclamations. The alarm had been raised by the local gentry, and yeah, there were three proclamations that the king issued. First one on the 30th of May. Um, and you can see those in the British Library. It's great that we're able to access these things um, using the internet, as well as actually going down and, and, and uh, seeing them for ourselves. Um, word was spreading right across Europe. So here's a comment from the Venetian ambassador. The rising of the peasants has gone on growing from day to day to such an extent that they only required a leader to make it formidable and open rebellion. And it's recorded in the annals. Um, um, ooh, I've lost my place. Yeah, it's recorded in Howe's annals. Um, who uh, and, and in those annals, when you can read that um, script, which isn't that easy to read, he says, about the middle of this month of May, 1607, a great number of common persons suddenly assembled themselves in Northamptonshire, and then others of like nature assembled themselves in Warwickshire and some in Leicestershire. They violently cut and break down hedges, filled up ditches and laid open all such enclosures of commons and other grounds as they found enclosed, which of ancient time had been open and employed to tillage. Now, we know that um, the Venetian ambassador said that they only required a leader to make it formidable and open rebellion. Well, here he is, Captain Pouch, John Reynolds, said to be from Desborough. He was a tinker and he was later called the base ringleader and turbulent varlet and was the chiefest lead leader of the Midland Revolt. And he appeared um, and he had a belt and a satchel attached to that. And he said that within that satchel, within that pouch, he had something which would protect people from all harm. And that he, he had, um, he had the right from God and from the king to encourage them to put down enclosures. He told the people that they shouldn't be violent, they should do it peacefully. Um, but he seems to have been a character that turned up in a number of these places where the rebellions took place. Um, and he was eventually arrested and we'll find out what happened to him later. But he is the chiefest leader, said to be from Desborough. This is one of the letters or part of one of the letters that was sent on the 11th of June after the events at uh, Newton, um, where he describes what went on. And he's saying that um, there were a, a thousand of these people, who, these fellows who turned themselves levelers. And I think this is one of the first times that that term is used. Um, these fellows who turned themselves levelers were busily digging, but were furnished with many half pikes and staves, long bills and bows and arrows and stones. Now, Sir, Ant Sir Anthony Mildmay and Sir Edward Montacute, it says here, Sir Edward Montague, that is, they were the, the deputy lieutenants. And they were the people who the king was saying, look, guys, you are responsible for making sure that the county of, of Northamptonshire is safe. Um, and is quiet and not rebellious. So I want you to control what's going on. They tried to call out the trained bands, the militia, but the trained bands wouldn't come out, which I think sounds to me quite remarkable um, that um, you, know, you have the deputy lieutenants saying, local militia, come out and help us. They refused. Um, so, Mild May and Montague had to use their own servants. Um, and they gathered them. They read the proclamation, the king's proclamation twice. Um, but nothing happened. The, fir the first time nothing happened. And then they read it, read it again. Some of them ran um, and then they charged. 
and the second charge, some people ran away in which were slain some 50, 40 or 50 of them, and a very great number hurt. And there's a letter that I haven't got in this presentation, but a letter which says that um, women and children were involved as well, um, and they were hurt as much as the men. So that's what happened um, on the 8th of June, according to the Earl of Shrewsbury. Now, I wonder, the Earl of Shrewsbury is saying 40 to 50 people were killed, and that's the figures that we're using now. But I do wonder whether that's a, a, a true record um, or whether there were more people killed than 40 or 50, because we know how statistics can be manipulated. In the History of Northamptonshire by John Bridges, which was published in 1791, um, we learn firsthand from Thomas, Re Thomas Cox, who's the rector of Little Addington, um, about the events at Newton near Geddington. So there we have that. Now, strangely, um, that um, parish register has been subsequently lost. And it would be great if we actually were able to put our hands on something which was written at that particular time, but we can't do that. Um, but we do know that this is that this had been noted down and was published in 1791. In the fray, some were killed and wounded and many taken prisoner. Um, it's said that they were imprisoned in uh, St. Faith's Church at Newton. And the, the people, the leaders were tried and they were hanged and quartered and their quarters were set up at Northampton and all Thrapston and other places um, to persuade people not to um, not to involve in such rebellions in the future. Captain Pouch. Captain Pouch was picked up at Withybrook, I believe, um, and he was tried and executed summarily. And I understand that he was hanged and he was hanged and quartered. Um, and some of his courses would be hanged, ha hung up in various different places around the county. And his, pur his purse was found, his pouch was found. And when they opened it, the Serza Chronicles say, therein was only a piece of green cheese. So that was what was going to save people um, from um, being apprehended um, and stopped from protesting. A piece of green cheese. The diggers and levellers who were referred to in um, at this time in, in, in some of the documentations, obviously they go on um, in the uh, in the Civil War, the revolution, the, the English Revolution, um, to become more organised. Uh, Jared there's Win Stanley, England is not a free people till the poor that have no land have a free allowance to dig and labour the commons. Now, the king had, did say that um, in one of his proclamations, his third proclamation, I think it was, um, in that proclamation, he, uh, he, he allowed people um, to apologise, to um, come to Bowton House, and to sign an apology document. Um, and if they did that, he would pardon them for being involved in the rebellion. And they had to apologize and sign the apology document by Michaelmas. Now, most of them couldn't write. Um, and so there are some of the marks that they made on the apology document, which is in the record office in Northamptonshire, in, in Northampton. And on the memorial stone that um, we erected, um, on the outside of the memorial stone, we've got those markings, um, or as near as we can to those markings. There was a Royal Commission to investigate what happened, to look at illegal enclosure and depopulation across the Midlands. Lovely, that's great. Very good that they had a Royal Commission. And they found that a number of Northamptonshire gentlemen had um, acted against the law and they were convicted. Um, Thomas Tresham of Newton was found guilty of enclosure of 400 acres, uh, but they were fined, and it appears the land wasn't restored to the people, um, but there was the, the, the landowners were allowed to keep that land. So the Crown gained from the fines, 
and the landowners uh, gained from being able to um, keep the land, although they've been convicted um, and found guilty. Okay, Shakespeare is around this time. He's still writing his plays um, on the cusp of Elizabeth and James the First. It always amazes me how he is able to, within his plays, actually talk politics but hide politics so that he didn't have his head chopped off. Um, and in 1607, um, Susanna Shakespeare married, Susanna Shakespeare, his daughter, married John Hall in Stratford on the 5th of June 1607. So we know he was around at this period of time, probably getting the flowers organised, the buffet sorted and all that kind of thing for his daughter's marriage. Now we know that Ladbrook, where, the, where a protest took place on the 2nd of June, is less than 20 miles from Stratford. We also know that in Coriolanus, which was written between, well, written, written around 1607, 1608, the first scene of Coriolanus features a bread riot. So it's quite possible that the events of Newton have had an effect on the writing of one of our, of our foremost, play, foremost playwright. We raised money in in Geddington, Newton, and locally um, in order to um, erect the memorial stone, which is there. Um, we had a we we held a pageant, and there you can see on the left hand side you can see Captain Pouch um, addressing the crowds of people. Um, we made it a real community event. We involved the school. Um, they were they 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 were involved in Morris dancing. We involved. Um, um, historical um, reenactors. Um, we involved um, the church. The church um, came, the, the vicar of Geddington marched with us. We marched from Geddington to Newton with the bells of the church ringing and a drum playing in front of us. Um, and um, he held a, a, a short service um, to commemorate um, the people who were killed at Newton in June 1607. And there we are marching up from Geddington to um, Newton and I'm there on the left hand side all dressed up. And there's the stone. Um, the stone commemorates the Newton Rebellion of the 8th of June 1607. During this uprising, over 40 Northamptonshire village, Northamptonshire villages are recorded to have been slain while protesting against the enclosure of common land by local landowners. May their souls rest in peace. You do wonder what would have happened if they had access to social media and if they had the A14, um, what would have happened? Um, I'm sure that um, there would be stuff all over Twitter. It would have been, there would have been a twi twi Twitter storm about this. Facebook would have been going mad and things would have become even very seriously out of control. Now the growth of literacy is important here. And maybe this is one of the reasons that we um, don't have a lot of information about what went on um, in 1607 firsthand from people, because you would have thought that this would be um, a story that would have been passed down from person to person through the generations, but it appears not to have been passed down. Perhaps they weren't recorded. It wasn't very recorded very strongly in the first place. I don't know. Um, but of course, in 16, uh, 1611, after these events, the King James's Bible um, was published, and that that started um, a great move towards the increase of literacy amongst people, amongst the common people. Um, and there are some of the common phrases from the from the Bible: "To give up the ghost, the salt of the earth, put words in my mouth, a law unto himself." All of those very very well known um, and familiar um, phrases. They're all in the King James's Bible. And maybe if it had happened, if the, the events had happened a little bit later, things would have, um, think the, the outcomes would have been very different, or perhaps they would have been put down more rigorously. I don't know. Now, yeah. Then we move on a little bit to more modern days. And of course, Save Weekly Hallwood has some links with the Wellingborough Limes, I guess. Um, 
And so Weekly Hall Wood is um, an organization, a community organization that's been set up to um, protect and uh, protect land um, in the north of Kettering from um, destruction and from the building of five massive warehouses um, by the Bowton Estates in Weekly Parish. Um, Weekly Hall Wood and Meadow was enclosed by an Act of Parliament in 1809. And here on a map of Weekly Parish, you can see on the left hand side, um, you can see a Weekly Hall, which is Weekly Hall Wood. Um, and then attached to that is a, a piece of land there where which says Common. <clears throat> and that is the piece of land where at the moment there's a planning application in that's been in since 2020, just at the beginning of, um, of the pandemic, at the beginning of lockdown. Um, where um, Bowton properties are proposing to put to erect five massive warehouses and we're fighting that because we want to ensure as much as we can that that land remains land which is open to the public. Um, it's well used by um, walkers, runners, um, dog walkers, people just using for exercise and we know even more so after the pandemic um, that access to open spaces is ever so important and that area of of getting of Kettering hasn't got an awful lot of uh, open space this is a place which we need to preserve the law locks up the man or woman that steals the goose from off the common but lets the greater villain loose who steals the common from the goose that is a that's a, a an illustration um from Nick Hayes, who wrote the Book of Trespass, who came to Geddington um, and visited Newton. Um, he produced this beforehand. Um, and it's not related, well, it is related to Newton, but it, it's not um, as a response to Newton. Um, it's a response to the um, campaign um, for um, open access to land. This is a group of people not and if they're not linked directly to the Newton Rebellion, but people who protested against um, one of the applications um, for warehouses around Weekly Hall Wood. And about 200 to 300 people turned up outside the council offices at Kettering during a planning committee meeting. Never had people seen so many people protesting against um, a plan um, in that kind of way. Very effective but we still don't know what's going to happen. The, still the application is pending. Um, on the left hand, on the right hand side there is one of the illustrations that Nick, or, or the illustration that Nick did produce, Nick Hayes did produce um, for the Save Weekly Hallwood campaign. And you can see the word Amarmus above it. Um, that is a direct echo to um, the motto of the Duke of Buccleuch, whose um, coat of arms is on the left-hand side there, um, where it says, Ammo, Ammo, I love. And Nick is challenging that to say, Amamus, we love. We love um, common land. We love um, nature. We love trees. We love the access that we have um, to common land. So quite clever. So I need you, we need you to tell the story. It's a story that hasn't been told very much until fairly recently, um, and it needs to get passed down um, as much as we possibly can, which is why I'm glad to be talking to you today and, and talking to other groups. We need to make sure that kids in school know about it. Uh, we need to make sure that historians do recognize it and they clearly are recognizing it now. Um, one of the books that I would recommend to you is um, a book called, it's come out this year, The Blazing World by Jonathan Healy, who's a professor at Oxford University, A New History of Revolutionary England. I've read it. It's, he's done an amazing amount of research. It is detailed, but the way he writes is not as an academic. It's, he writes in a way that's very accessible for people. And it, I mean, it's a big book, so it did take me about a month to get through, um, but I wasn't reading it all the time and I'd, I'd strongly recommend it. And the events at Newton are part of his story. 
um, but it's he's, he talks about the 17th century all the way from the accession of James I to the accession of Queen Anne. Um, and I'd forgotten that that was just 100 years from the death of Elizabeth to Queen Anne. Such a change, such a change. And during that period of time, obviously there was the revolution um, and what's, what came out of the revolution was something of a compromise, but it was the beginnings of parliamentary democracy. So really important. Yeah, those are the people who've been really, really helpful and have helped to raise the profile. Um, and further reading, Feudalism to Capitalism, it's quite an old book now. Uh, it's got a big chapter on the Newton, the, the events at Newton um, and the blazing world there. Go to the British Library, loads of stuff in there. And then we've got um, a website which does need a lot of revamping. Um, the uh, the newtonrebels.org um, website it isn't up to date and needs to be sorted out and made more modern. That's where I'm going to stop. So is this where you would like us to take a little bit of a comfort break, Paul? Well, I was going to first of all thank you, John, for um, what was a brilliant presentation, and uh, and also to congratulate you and other people in in in, in and around um, Newton and Geddington and that in that area for putting this whole history of Newton and the Mid Midland Revolt on the agenda, you know, and 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 mm. and I think it, it it takes a lot of hard work and. Um, and research and uh, and activity to to get to this point. So I just wanted to congratulate you and others. Obviously, it's a collective act, but uh, you cl clearly played a significant part in that in 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 getting to this to this position. So on behalf of ISW, thank you very much for a fantastic uh, presentation. Um, what I would like to to suggest uh, to colleagues is that we do take a, a five minute break now. Um, just so that people can perhaps have a drink or go to the loo or whatever you want to do. So if we come back at uh, at eight o'clock, uh, oh. you can leave your computer on, you can leave uh, Zoom open, you don't have to leave. Um, you may want to turn off your video and, and certainly uh, if you wish, or alternatively, you can uh, leave your mic, you can unmute yourselves and uh, continue chatting. It's up to you, the, 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 the Zoom is open. Uh, so whatever you want to do, but we'll come back formally to reopen the meeting um, at, uh, at eight o'clock. And I'm now going to pause uh, the recording. As ready as I can be, I don't, I mean, right. what, what I would say is that um, I'm, I'm not an academic historian in any kind of way. Um, I'm, a, I suppose, a gatherer of information, really. What's a, what's an academic historian, John? I mean, uh, you, 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 we, we can all be organic intellectuals, uh, and um, and and I would certainly put you in that category. And your the history that you're recording is certainly the, the better than some of the history that I've seen written by so-called academic historians. I mean, um, so <laughs> I shouldn't run yourself down. Um, but anyway, let's re let's restart the meeting. Do, do, do who wants to contact? If you could. Uh, indicate whether you wish to um, by by pressing the reaction button um, and, and indicate whether you wish to to speak. Who, who would like to kick off? Chris, you got your well, hand. I'll just I'll just say um, it, it's a, a fantastically interesting story and. Um, thanks to John and to everyone who's promoted it and publicised it. That's all. <clears throat> that was short and sweet. <laughs> yeah, I think um, for me, it's like it does, really did link the Tudors and the Stuarts and the uh, and the death of the of uh, or the execution of Charles I. It was that that really initially fascinated me because we're told. You know, we told the stories of uh, Good Queen Bess, and uh, clearly things hadn't been entirely sorted. But one of the people who's told who's told us that was um, was Shakespeare, a great propagandist for um, for the monarchy. But underneath that, he's also a, he's also clever enough to be able to point to things that weren't going right and to make some some criticisms. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. John, I mean, one, one of, oh, did, um, John, did you want to speak? Which John? You. Oh, right, yes. I, it was fascinating. I found it fascinating. I'd heard of the Newton Rebellion, but I didn't realise how widespread it was. Yeah. What I'd like to know, John, is um, you said there was a book, The Blazing World. Who yep. was the author? Jonathan Healy. H-E-A-L-E-Y. It's only just come out. I found it by chance. I found it in Waterstones. Right. And I bought, my, I bought one copy and I bought two this morning for friends of mine. And the other sources you used were from the British Library, were they? Well, I, bet, I mean, there's loads of sources I've, I've used. Um, yeah, there's lots of stuff in the British Library. Um, you can find you can find house annals on, on the um, on the internet. I don't, I can't honestly, I can't remember how I found them, but you you can find that, and you can you can. I think it it might be British History Online. I can't remember, but you can get you can get quite a lot of you know actual historical documents that were written in the 17th century and you can see them which is absolutely fascinating um i've i mean steve hendel has written um um a written about about the newton rebellion mm. um and one of the um pieces that he's written is on the newton rebels web website um he he's also but he's specialized in early modern history and he was the one who when i i googled the midland revolt and somehow or other his name came up and warwick university came up so i contacted him and mm. said can i come and talk to you and he was great and i said is is it is this an important event he said yes it's an important event um mm. it, it isn't something that people have told stories about it hasn't featured very much you can find it at that time you could find some information in more academic historical works um but it's starting to become more known in works which are more accessible um to the general public really but he said yes it was very important and it was one of the last times that the peasantry rose up against the gentry mm -hmm. is there much in the northampton records um, office Yes, there is the, the yeah. apology doc. I haven't seen it. I've, I've, people have seen it. I have yet to to actually put my hands on it or put my eyes on it, um, mm. because every time I've I've gone to them, they've not been able to uh, to to locate it. But it is there. Um, it is there because I know people who have who have yeah. put uh, put their eyes on it. Yeah. yeah, and there will be more information that hasn't been dug out, um, which is prob which are probably in the um Baclue archives oh, yeah. some of which are kept at that the house. Northampton record office oh, yeah. well some of them are at the, the record office but some of them are at Banton House right. we did um the, where the memorial is placed is actually on um Baclue land on Banton land and we did ask permission for the estate to do that and the estate manager said to us we the family think that it's come to the stage where we can talk about this yeah well where where we're happy for other people yeah. to, we're we're okay about people talking about it yeah thank, thank you very you. much thanks a few hundred years later a bit, i know i know but better late than never uh, well, chris you've got still, your, you've they're got still your in closing up. land aren't they <laughs> yeah, yeah you're still in closing land um Chris, do you got your hand up again? Is that a legacy hand, or is it? Did you want to speak? Again? No, it is a real hand. It's a bit of an aside, but I, I would recommend people to the Counterfire website, where today there was a very interesting article on the Diggers' song, which um, examines it and aims to take it back to the original text in from the papers of, uh, I Amazing. think it's Sir William Clark, the military administrator who um, took down the notes of the Putney debates. Um, so that's today's Counterfire web, website, uh, www.counterfire, whatever, Google it. Um, very interesting article published today. On the is, that the song, is that the song you know will diggers all stand up now? Is that it, the is, one? It, is, it is, but it's going back through the various yeah, fascinating, um, be fascinating. modern versions to the original, original text and making yeah. some observations as well. So that's a bit of an aside, but... Uh, really no, there mean, is a big it, there's a big chunk in here about the Putney debate yeah 
I think that I think it, it's not an aside, um, Chris, because th there are linkages here in history, yeah. isn't there? I mean, uh, what, what I mean, the the Coventry uh, part of the Midlands uprising called themselves diggers, and I don't think it's any coincidence that when Stanley yeah. and uh, the Wellingborough diggers in, in around the sixteen forties called themselves diggers. There's a, there's almost certainly a link there. And um, because not all, of course, the, the protesters uh, set up communes to dig the common land. I mean, they, they but they described themselves as that and the name became adopted. Um, but um, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat if I can get it off. Oh, brilliant. Anybody else wish to speak? Uh, Tony, I see you waving. Uh, yeah, I wonder whether, John, you can say we could talk a bit more about land ownership. The, uh, yeah. as, I, I, as I understand it, we've got a situation in Northamptonshire where much the same families own Northamptonshire as did at the time you were talking. I think there's a direct link, isn't there, between the Montagues and the Bucuse? Oh, they, yeah. Either, either they married into it or they bought it or... Anyway, it's the same sort of, you know, you go through them, Spencers, Treshams, uh, they all the same. And yeah, they a, haven't yeah, changed cool. in 500 years. And some people would say there's not, wasn't a lot of change between the Norman Conquest and with some changes up until uh, the time you're talking about. So we really need to move on the consciousness in this country of land ownership. And it seems to me that there was certainly another 200 years, uh, please comment uh, in a moment, from, um, uh, from the Peasants' Revolt and the Diggers, where it only got worse, okay? So they stopped being illegal enclosures, they became legal enclosures. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Parliament. Yeah. So every sort of few decades through the 18th, 19th centuries, you had further enclosures. And the only thing that changed, as far as I can see, is that actually death duties were introduced by the Liberal government before the First World War. And that began to put the, you know, it began to spotlight some of the land ownership issues with bigger tracts of land going, becoming exchanged in lieu of tax owed death duties by these families. So uh, we need to move on from that, I think. Um, we need to move on to actually looking at ways in which we can get land uh, as we ought to have done all along, redistributed, re redistributed away from these people because whilst they still have the power, they still have the power mm. to deny people uh, living space and put up warehouses instead of those spaces being free to people to, to use. And uh, yeah, uh, I think, uh, and I know that um, there was a, Labour Party report 2016 on on land. I know it's gone on being a, a strong issue to do with just how we get this movement, how we get it changed. Uh, any comments, reflections? I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because I think I think uh, I think in Britain, in England, England is probably different from Scotland. In fact, it is different from Scotland on this, isn't it? Because yeah. um, we know through the um, campaign to save Weekly Hall Wood, 
we've attempted to get the estates to give us a, a, a cost of the land because we might think that we could um, fundraise and we might we might try to buy to buy that land now a group of people in Scotland have done just that but the law the land laws in Scotland are different from the land laws in England and it would be much more difficult in England to be able to do that but sort of linking in with that as well was I, I remember oh it must have been oh when I was in my 20s going to a meeting and I think I don't know what meeting it was but we we got to talk about rights and responsibilities and what rights do we have um and somebody says well, we have the right to own land and I went what why do we have the right to own land and nobody else agreed with me <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I really I thought oh I don't think the same as those people <laughs> you know yes yeah. You know, it's, it was quite interesting, but but I think in in England we do entrenched in some of us there is that feeling of an Englishman's home is his castle, oh. and that feeling of we need we should own land. Oh. I guess in Europe that's going to be somewhat different as well because um, there's far more rented accommodation in, um, and uh, in, in Europe than there is in 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 England in Britain. There are changes in culture, aren't there? Um, and going back to what you were saying about the Montagues and the Buccleuse, yeah, the the Dukes of Buccleuse are the Montague family, but they made the right marriages to people in different parts of the nobility. So they're yeah. now the Montague Douglas Scots. Um, and uh, yeah, so they're known, known as the Montague Douglas Scots and uh, commonly apparently known as the MDSs if you're in the right circles. Um, but they, it, it was interesting, I found, I didn't expect that, that, that um, the Montague family were very were strong Puritans. They were strong Puritans. They weren't Roman Catholics. They were the new faith. But of course, their their the links between Puritanism, I think, and capitalism as well. And religion is then the book brings out all the conflicts of religion as well that I found really mind blowing. You know the the Episcopalians in Scotland, um, the dissenters in 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 England the Presbyterians the Anglicans and all the different um faiths that um were exposed as soon as the the, the English Revolution happened fascinating and to try to link all those things together would be wonderful mm -hmm. I mean Nick Hayes in who is he's a he's a great guy I really recommend his book of Trespass and the Trespassers Companion which he's written and that we've got a part in and um, they call me a local he calls me a local historian in that which I was <laughs> quite pleased about um, but I mean, he seems to have an understanding of a very very broad span of um, issues and how they link together and in his work he's met up with um, landowners and has engaged with them not in an adversarial way but in a way where they've had interesting and sometimes helpful conversations which is yeah. uh, which is unusual i think it's a good book and mm, i think you're quite right about his um his describing all these people Beautiful. who yeah. own all this land yeah i think i don't know whether he goes on because i've read the companion but i'm wondering does a companion go on to saying what we do about it now yes yeah that's yeah, okay. that's very much that's, what he's what I say it's yeah it's it's very much he, he says that actually you shouldn't keep this book in libraries you need to okay. get it out into the fields you need to get it dirty you take it with you yeah yeah now we need to to i know we need to take the land back mm. <laughs> woody guthrie yeah 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 well of course i mean this uh, meadow at weekly hall wood which was common land up to 1809. It was enclosed in 1809. Um, then it was used, um, it was quarried. Um, and and it, so, so they made, the, the family made money out of that through quarrying. Um, then it was landfilled. So they made money out of that. Um, and then they grew trees on parts of the, 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 uh, the area surrounding it and they're making money out of that. But if they build warehouses, so it, it would be the final act of enclosure really, because, you, there's a bloody great warehouse in the way and um a bird like the um the great the grasshopper warbler which comes from africa in in may or june 
and apparently, according to um, a guy on the campaign who knows about knows so much about ecology and nature, he says that um, the grasshopper warblers are born in a particular place. They fly back to Africa and then they come back to the place where they were born. They, that's what they do. Who knows how they do that? But they do that. And what so that, so that you, you have a picture of this little bird who's born on Weekly Hall Wood Meadow, who's born there, flies off, comes back and there's a bloody great warehouse in the way. You know, where do I go? I'm homeless. I, yeah, I feel it's, it's, heart, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I share your feelings about it, but and I also perhaps share the feelings of some of the people who like to, some of the human beings who like to share the space with the uh, warbler. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and, and can't either. Can't. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, in the current age, the only way in which we can take back or control land ownership is to is, is is through public ownership of the of land mostly through local authorities uh, or nationalized industries that's historically how i mean the biggest return of the common land happened after the second world war with yeah. the national with nationalization of the private utilities and the um the the, the ownership of land by public public bodies and um but uh, that's the only way we can do it. I mean, I, I learned a lot when I was on Wallingwood Council as chair of the, 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 what was then the development committee, that uh, ownership of land is power. If you own land, you can, you can either do things um, subject to planning applications or block things. Um, there's a huge amount of power vested in, 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 in just simply in the ownership of land. And, um, and that, and we don't, it's not really very transparent in the UK. Land ownership is incredibly well hidden, as I think you, you referred to. Most people just do not have a clue um, who owns the land in, 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 in Britain or, or in England. And um, a land which is up for development often seems to pass through various hands. And, it, you know, it's planning applications are often not in the name of the owner, but, you know, a, a development consortium. Or, well, any, uh, anyone can apply for planning permission on any bit of land. Yes, in you theory. Don't, you don't need to own the land no, in order to apply no. for planning permission. It no. doesn't mean you can carry out your planning permission because mm. the owner mm. of the land can block it. Mm. That's why it's really important for, if, in the public interest that public, you, that, that, you know, democratic public bodies own as much land as possible and doesn't flog it off. That's the, the tragedy of... of um, of, of most local government and, and Labour has been as complicit in this as Tories is flogging yeah. off public yeah. land um, there, to developers. And uh, I mean, if you want to do something and make money, then you lease it. At least if you lease land, you, you, you maintain ownership uh, and maintain a high degree of control ultimately in how that land can, can, can move forward, but you don't sell it. Mm. But, uh, that's a lesson that uh, hasn't been learned by many, many people. But anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm rabbiting on now. Who, who else would like to, to say anything? Um, Maureen, did you have anything you wanted to say? I'm just thinking that um, builders are um, gathering to, together great bits of land and then they hang on to it, don't they? Mm. That's the current. Land um, banking, it's you. called. Yeah. And then they yeah. only build bigger houses and things. So, yeah. It's so. any of uh, Weekly Hall Wood, uh, it's presumably ancient woodland since it appears on old maps. Where, how Some parts of it. Sorry, go on. Yeah. Um, and you're, you're, you're doubtless aware that the planning system does at, at least nominally provide some <clears throat> protection to ancient woodland. Yeah, ancient woodland is part of Weekly or Wood, but it's not the area that is threatened by, it isn't directly threatened um, mm. by the development. There's a, there's a number of um, more recently planted woodland, which is around the ancient woodland, mm. Mm. Um, but that's not protected. Um, and it, th those, are, those are the trees that we're principally concerned about. But clearly, that if you're changing the environment and if you're changing the surrounding land 
that's yeah. going to have an effect on yeah. the um the ecology um of of of, of the land and on mm. the and the habitats of creatures um mm. and on the habitats mm. that, are, that are developed uh, around around that site so it i think there's an incremental um an, an incremental issue there as well i mean there is there is a there's a path a public path that goes all the way from Brambleside to Newton um and goes right not through the ancient woodland it goes past the ancient woodland um and I'm hoping that we develop a, a rebels trail because we know that some of the people who went to Newton to protest would have come from Kettering and the logical way they would have gone would have been um through that path which is directly to newton mm. and so uh, I'm, I'm actually seeing a public footpath here from yeah. newton um through Geddington what, grange what's shown as weekly hall woods um yeah. whether that's the ancient woodland or not I, I obviously i can't tell from this map but um and has anybody done uh, has there been a, a, an ecological report as part of the planning application loads of them we're, we're, we're doing some of our own um, right. because we we challenge some of the um, uh, some of the reports that are within the documentation. But the documentation, right. oh, have a look at it. Um, I mean, it's all in the public domain, but there's about four hundred documents. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. so many of them are written. I mean, there's some of them are written in jargon. Um, surprise, surprise! It's very difficult. They're very dense documents it's very difficult to understand what they mean um and a number of them are selling documents as well so um they're the developers trying to put forward their vision of what they would like to see so that it's written mm. in that particular mm. kind of way which mm. is quite um um attractive really if you don't and look underneath it um yeah but there's so much information it's no. it's almost as though they've bombarded us with so much information that mm. we can't read mm. it all that you used know? to be my day job, but I've been retired for 12 years, um, <clears throat> scrutinising planning applications as an ecologist. But, um, yeah. Well, the, the county ecologist, we, the county ecologist has challenged a number of the reports um, mm. because they they were done at the wrong time of year. They were wrong. Um, they weren't recent, so there was a number of them that have been challenged, and that was one. Of, that's one of the reasons that they've that they've held up um, the um, the development. Um, there may be other reasons. Um, yeah, I could go into it for a very. I could carry on talking about this for a very long time, but that's probably not helpful. Mm. Could I, could but at, ask, at the moment, um, actually. The, there's three villages. There's Geddington, Newton, and Lightly who have put in objections to the second phase of um, the planned development uh, on the basis of the traffic impact, um, and that is interesting because that's sort of tied in with the east of Kettering and the the, the access road from the east of Kettering around Kettering, mm -hmm. um, and who knows. Um, uh, that if those villages are really protesting against that and put put in planning applications that might sorry putting in planning objections that might in some kind of way um um hold things up a, a little bit during which time the 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 local plan review which is a strategic document um during which time that's going to be reviewed and during that time we would hope that some more issues relating to ecology and the environment are added because things have changed you know i'll stop talking i could go on for it, seven it's hours all, it's all tied up isn't it with local yeah. planning i mean and and whose opinions count yeah who who's values are going to be affected and everything and, and maureen how accessible it is because um one of the 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 key reason that this land is threatened is that the local plan when it was developed about 10 years ago mm. um it identified this land as employment land well, it was allocated for employment i was just thinking you know and once it's in that local plan and it's allocated for that reason you have to have a very 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 strong mm. uh, legal recommend uh, legal argument against it Mm. Now, they will say that the local plan, and quite rightly, there was local consultation, but people 
don't respond to consultations in that kind of distanced way. They'll respond to application. They'll respond to planning applications directly. But in terms yeah. of strategic plans, they don't respond to that because no, no. it's not explained yeah. properly its impact. So there's a real problem there. Yeah. John, one of but the it, one of the suggestions that I made with rather tongue in cheek is that uh, as part of perhaps the review of the strategic plan that people could put could suggest that Boughton House itself becomes some sort of housing estate and and with the argument being that it's a dedicated housing estate for those that are going to be displaced from the islands in the Pacific that will be destroyed by global warming interesting but so it, it, you know it's not clearly a, a, a serious application but it's but but it, but it transfers the debate yeah. it moves the debate right into the heart of the Belton house and the montague family yeah. Yeah. Uh, in terms of their responsibility around global warming and the sort of that sort and the weekly wood development is part of that global warming project anyway it's just a just a, a new a kind of a, a a suggestion sure, sure the campaigners the may wish to consider i'm sure the, I'm sure the duke would, would be delighted <laughs> anyway well the um, three the three key issues for the book the, the three key themes for the buclu estate are community the environment and education yeah well that fits That's all cool. three doesn't it certainly does yeah <laughs> anyway uh, does anybody else want to speak russ stan tom Wilkie, you, you all haven't spoken yet. I'm going to give you the opportunity to come in now. Otherwise, I think the meeting will, will wind up. Can I just ask, can I, can I just ask a quick... Just Russ, Russ, if you yeah. come in. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry I missed the first part. Um, it's absolutely fascinating, John. Thank you very much. And I'm going to be um, mm -hmm. catching up on the first part on YouTube, hopefully. Um, I've got a question about something which... I'm not sure if I if I read it or if I imagined it, but somewhere I've read I read I think, and I've not been able to find it again. That there was an uprising in Kingsthorpe, and it was mostly women, and it was around at the same time as the enclosures. And it was an up, it was um, um, I think they were pulling up hedges or something like that. Um, and I just wondered if you'd come across this reference. I haven't. I'm fascinated by it. It'd be interesting to find out more about it. If, if Anybody you do else find it, about it? Where I've did you find it? People, that's, that's the point, John. I can't remember where I found it. I know. It's one of those things. I was, I was, I was looking for something else, and I, I read this, and I thought, wow, that's interesting. I have to come back to that, and I've never found it again. <laughs> so, if you do find it, um, first, first of all, it'll uh, be very interesting for me anyway. But secondly, it'll also um, has saved my sanity because I'm going to think I've imagined it. <laughs> the other thing, John, is just quickly. Um, I've I've kind of um, I, I've never met you. Before. I think I might have met you once, but um, I'm always impressed by how many things go on in Geddington, and um, I've always think how are they how are they pulling this off. Um, all the events you have going on there, you have different. You know, you had um, I think three acres and a cow recently. Um, you did. You had the. Uh, you've had various other things. And uh, sometimes it'd be interesting if you wanted to do a talk on how you do all this. <laughs> well, yeah, it is. a. I mean, I think it is a special place. Um, it's about the right size. It's about the right size. It's got quite a mixed population. It's got quite, we've managed, uh, quite, we, we're a community which, which, yes, there are people who've moved in, but there's also quite a lot of old families who've stayed, who've lived here for a long time. Um, and I think they that all that that mix uh, helps the, the the community to work really well. And I'm very fond of the place. Yeah, it's a beautiful it's a beautiful village. I mean, it's a beautiful village anyway, but it's beautiful as well because it is com quite community orientated. And I'm determined to as far as I can to bring um, like different um, different performers um, to the village to help in just. Uh, to help the, the cultural life of the village, I suppose. Yeah. 
but it isn't just me. I mean, it's, it's, there's a, a, a lot of other event, a lot of other organisations and things going on, activities going on. It's quite an active place, and it's quite a mixed place politically. I mean, people do think of Geddington being oh, a village that is very conservative. It when it was apparently when it was the rural district council, <clears throat> it elected two Labour and two quite often in, uh, elected two Labour and two Tory. Um, um, uh, councillors I, I don't know the facts on that but that's what I'm told and certainly I um, at the moment we've got a conservative unitary councillor um but um Labour held it for about for about 12 years um so it's it's mixed really it's mixed the People's Republic of Geddington <laughs> I'm not sure it's entirely I'm not I wouldn't actually make a claim for that I would have, <laughs> I'll be pelted by stones by people yeah. and talked about in the pub. <laughs> Just, um, I'm going to start to wind up now, but I want to give Russ and Stan an opportunity to come in here on a, a related issue, and that is the development of the um, um, radical history tours in in Northampton, which um, may also develop into a North Northamptonshire, uh, his, you know, radical history tour. Uh, after this um, pilot. So I'm just wondering, Russ and Stan, whether you want to say something a little bit more about <laughs> the radical history tours, which you've got planned. Yeah, um, I, I'll say a bit and um, be nice. And uh, John also, John Buckles also yeah, involved here. with this project. So, um, you know, it's a, we're very much sharing this out amongst us. Um, yes, we've, we've, um, we've done a lot of work on this. We've been collecting information. Um, some of it's come from, actually, I think some came from you, John. Um, and um, we are ready now for our first walk. Um, we're going to be doing a sort of a trial run, if you like, uh, in May, and then um, another one in June. Um, but I don't want to say too much because um, I don't want to take the limelight on this because uh, Stan and John have been very active on this as well. So uh, which one of you wants to speak first, John or Stan? <laughs> You're pointing the wrong way, Stan. We've all been active. We've all done. We all have. Well, do you want to say anything, John, about it? Uh, well, um, well, Stan, Stan and I um, worked out a route about a week ago and walked it and timed it. We, we wanted to do a tour for 60 minutes, stopping at um, various points, uh, five or six points, uh, with different aspects of history. There's suffragettes, there's... Um, uh, anti-slavery, trade unionism, uh, peace campaigns, uh, and we've managed to fit them all in a fairly short, uh, for a fairly short walk, just basically around the, the, the market square, really up the drapery market square, Fish Street, um, back to All Saints Church where we start. But we've, we've also been looking, haven't we, Russ, at um, the practical side of it with whether we need insurance and whether we need, well, we've, we've cracked the uh, the permission side of it, haven't we? Uh, we, we mm. Emma Roberts, Councillor Emma Roberts, uh, got on the case for us, and we, we apparently we don't need permissions from the council or anything like that. So yeah, it's all <coughs> it's all coming together. So I think do you have a ma mailing list. Um, do you have a mailing uh, list? Yeah. Yes, really I'll, I'll put I'll put something in the chat, uh, Chris. Okay. Um, so if you could uh, write to us, we have a. We have an email address um, we've set up an event right which isn't hasn't gone public yet um may, all right thanks for giving me the time on this paul um don't want to go on too long but um essentially we, we think in the first one we we're going to do we're going to um have sort of people that we know on it and we're hoping that they will be you know give us good critical um feedback on it um so we're not we don't think we're going to make the first one public just yet so it'll probably be june um, before we, we make Is it, it public. June or but July, I'll... Russ? Uh, uh, Stan, you said to me earlier that it was the 16th July. of July. July. Sorry, July. July. Sorry. Yeah. So it is July, yes. So the first one's on May the 21st, I believe, and the second one will be on the 16th of July. But, yes. Both both of us, 11 o'clock. May 21st, uh, did you say? Yeah. Uh, both Sundays. Yeah. So Sunday mornings at 11. Uh, meeting at all saints church but for details like uh, as was said the first one appears to be a private one won't be advertised mm -hmm. publicly um but the second one will be but it just as um 
the uh, there's also a Facebook group, Northamptonshire. Uh, what did I say? Northamptonshire Radical History Group. Um, let me find. Oh, yeah, Radical and Rebellious History in Northamptonshire is the Facebook group, and certainly, certainly, these walks will be advertised uh, on that Facebook group, uh, Chris. So, if you join the Facebook group, not only do you get notification of these walks, but also you'll see that, that anything to do with local radical, rebellious history in Northamptonshire uh, will get can get po you know can get posted into that uh, Facebook group. I mean, we we will offer reductions on the cost of the walk as well. Oh, hang on a minute. No, they're going to be free. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, uh, that's, quite a, a quick one, a lovely story. When um, me and John were wandering around doing the test run, um, John was tour leader and I was uh, a punter. And uh, I have to be honest, I, I got so wrapped up in it, I didn't even notice this other guy walking past us uh, chipped in as well and uh, joined us and told us a few um, uh, interesting facts about the buildings we were looking at. So I thought, well, you know, it's... Uh, that was uh, real uh, testing, uh, testing the water there. Um, I have to say, as a newbie, uh, to some extent to the country, but also to Northampton, um, <laughs> I, I thought we were going to get outside the uh, town centre. But in John's good hands, we went from one building to one building to one building. And I hadn't realised the, the wealth, the richness of uh, radicalism at this time. You know, Northampton, fabulous. It's not radicalism, but there's there's there was somebody doing um, walks on Jewish history in in, oh, yeah, in Northampton yeah. as well because it, it was apparently quite an important uh, until the ex of the Jews. There's obviously quite an early date compared to most of your other uh, whether 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 there's anything you could include on that. Not much above ground, I believe. Um. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, we're, I want to say we're quite ruthless when we're looking at what we're going to include. So there's mm. loads of stuff we haven't included in the first walk, just out of uh, sheer necessity, we needed to cut it down because the inherent danger is, you know, we're just that, that, and that, and that. And I think we actually timed it um, when we were doing the, the little test run. And it, it's, it was interesting that, um, we got up to, um, we only got up one street and we were nearly a third of the way through time. So the necessity was actually to err on the side of, uh, let's keep it short and brief. And if we're under, excellent, then we can add to that. Plus as well, I mean, we've got a real uh, humdinger of a finale to the first walk. Isn't that right, Mr. Banks? <laughs> Are we going to have a riot? <laughs> oh, yeah, something even something even better. Sit down in the road. <laughs> no, we've got it. We, we've. <laughs> but no we've spoilers, spot. Dan. No spoilers. I'm, I'm not. Uh, there's, there's, no, no, no it's not. You, you'll probably see the spoiler on YouTube. No, you've got you've <laughs> got to join the walk to find out this yeah, the ending yeah. to this story. Uh, there don't is a. Get, don't there give is it a, away. There is a serious ending. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to wind up now, if that's okay. Just with a, yeah. a, a another announcement. Um, and this, this is directly related to tonight's theme. On, on Monday, um, I think most of you probably are aware, we have a, a May Day and Wellingborough Diggers or Diggers Festival combined event on Monday evening uh, coming up on May, Sunday, uh, Monday, May the 1st uh, at the Wellingborough African Caribbean Association starting at 6.30. Tickets are well, they're currently six pounds if you book now, but on the night they'll be eight pounds. So if you want to book tickets, get in, get in quick. Um, and uh, I think that's it, really. Is there any other announcements that people want to make about um, any local political activity or events? Um, oh. Yeah, Pal Palestine Action I have a, a siege of the um, the Elbit. Israel's largest arms company making drones and other things um, in Leicester, Meridian Way, Leicester, which is just off the M1, beginning on May the 1st. And they're, they're planning to stay there or possibly even on the roof until um, the plants shut down. They're calling for supporters, people who go along for the day and wave a Palestine flag and generally add to the support. So 
that's from May the 1st. And you can camp as well. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Chris, for that information. Can I just say a couple of things, Paul? Yeah. Um, National PCS union strike tomorrow. So the, um, I mean, I know in Northampton, the um, PCS um, members will be on strike at the uh, Gladstone Road Driver Vehicle Standards Agency office. Uh, also, the um, uh, nurses will be out um, Sunday evening, I think it's 8 o'clock, all the way through to 8 o'clock on Monday. They, they can't do 8 o'clock until Tuesday because of the court ruling today. Um, so the uh, nurses, so it's a question of checking uh, either strike map for um, uh, strike locations uh, or aka um, picket line locations for both PCS and uh, the RCN or go to the um, both uh, websites. RCN particularly um, has got a quite a good one which lists every um, you know, where the pickets will be um, uh, as well and also one to watch is uh, train drivers are out again. As, and and, our, and um, RMT, RMT have announced yeah. as well uh, further strike action. But anyway, thank you very much for that, Stan, and uh, good night, everybody, and yeah. thank you again to John. Really, thanks, um, John. Yeah, thanks, John. For, for, yeah. for, for, your, for an excellent contribution okay. and provoking so many different themes and uh, discussion uh, that followed. So thank you very much, everyone, and okay. the, uh, the, the, uh, the recording of this event will be on YouTube, hopefully, within the next couple of days. <coughs> cool. So keep, I will circulate the link. Uh, and put it on certainly put it on the ISW Facebook group and also send an email to ISW supporters. So keep your eyes out. Just 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 one quick one before we go. Um, in terms of the YouTube, will, will you be getting actors and actresses to play our parts? No. Okay. Oh, <laughs> no, it's the, it's the very simple yeah. answer. Okay. So uh, so it, yeah, it's too late to remove <laughs> yourself from the uh, from from mm. the YouTube video. Stand. We've got a budget, but it doesn't extend to that. No. <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you. The next ISW meeting will be uh, on, on the fourth Thursday of May. So um, we haven't got a theme yet for that meeting. So what, again, keep your eye out. But it's the, it, and it's the same link as tonight's meeting. ISW meetings always have the same Zoom link. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to join us, it's seven <coughs> o'clock um, on the fourth Thursday of every month. Okay. Before we you go, this is the book that I was searching for. It was a, a, at the back of my room, and um, which is probably a book that you know. It's John Martin's book, Feudalism to Capitalism, um, and there's a big chunk about um, the Midlands Revolt in it. Um, I, mean, I think it, I think it's written in the '80s. Um, yeah. It's not it's not a new book, but it's a a, a, a very sound book. Thank, Thank you. you very much, John. Thank you have you. the last word. Thank you. Okay. Bye now. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.